2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 22 to 26. And it's going to be continuing on in the theme that was just before this in the, in the chapter to try and, well, avoid or put down bad arguments within the congregation. And I mean bad, bad arguments not so much in the terms of uh, these are really pathetic arguments that you're putting forward and how dare you try to reason your way out of a paper bag. Um, but these are going to be arguments that are actually divisive to the congregation. Oh, in a previous devotional, I was going, I brought up uh, different examples of what could actually divide a congregation. Some of them are rather uh, benign or, or, if you will, practical, where people are trying to decide what to do with the building, per se, uh, for example. Um, but uh, for this, we're getting more into theological matters. So, uh, to lead us into the text itself, let us begin in prayer with Psalm 119, section Gimel. So, this is verses 17 to 24 in Psalm 119. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your just decrees at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones, who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight, they are my counselors. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. So this section of Psalm 19 is basically pleading to God that he deals with us according to his word, according to his promises, more specifically that God will uh, give us everything that he has promised. And for us as Christians, this means primarily, of course, all the beautiful blessings we have at the cross of Christ. So this will be the life of Christ, forgiveness, salvation, um, opening the way to the new heavens, new earth, and you can go on and on. Um, but uh, what we're also thinking of in this passage more specifically is well, looking to enabling us to follow God's word. So this will be more the righteousness that Christ gives to us, that uh, we would actually be righteous, that we would follow the word of the Lord and actually act rightly according to his law. So this is, this is why we needed Christ to come to us in the first place. We are sinners. We are those who have violated the law of the Lord, so we need Christ to forgive us our sins. But now that our sins are forgiven, we're also praying unto our Lord that we're able to do things rightly in this life for a change, that we turn away from our sins, that we actually do what is good and right in God's sight, that we actually follow all the commandments. And uh, part of this will actually be looking to the, or looking in opposition to what's going on in the world, because there's going to be those who still don't try to live according to God's word. Don't try to live according to the commandments. And we see this all around us. Now, of course, we're also seeing various Christians in the world. And uh, yeah, they're not going to be perfect because we're still struggling against sin, this side of heaven. But we're also going to be finding that the world outside of Christendom, uh, and this isn't going to be like dividing according to national lines or anything, but this is actually going to be even in our own backyard, possibly even literally if you have uh, people in your family who aren't Christian and who are going out into the backyard. But uh, the, yeah, this is the division between the church, the body of all believers, and the unbelieving world around us, and the unbelieving world will definitely try to follow sin rather than follow God's word. Now, the unbelieving world still has virtues. It still has a whole bunch of... Um, uh, directives that it can follow. A lot of these are actually ingrained through Christian society because Christians have had control over the Western world for quite some time now. And we have put the Ten Commandments as as front and center for our laws. So uh, you'll find that Christian traditions are actually fairly different from the traditions in, other, in, in the rest of the world. And uh, if the rest of the world is dealing with uh, the Western world economically, then it's, it's actually learned to follow more of the Christian rule. So as we see Christianity ebbing out of popularity today, we're actually seeing um, uh, more of a breakdown in how people act morally. 
And th this is, of course, going on where we see people kind of debating, well, who's right and who's wrong? Well, it's whoever has the right color skin or <laughs> whoever speaks rightly of the person with the right colored skin. And, it, and, and it's absolutely insane. Um, as that is the definition of racist, but they they keep calling everybody who speaks against them racist because they're trying to speak in favor of the people with the right color skin. <laughs> so it's racist talk, but they're actually trying to put race into the talk rather than actually talk about um, proper virtues or, or following what is good and right according to, well, the rules of society, laws of society, and even the laws of God himself. So, um, yeah, we find ourselves in opposition to the world around us as we try to live uh, according to how God directs. And um, sometimes this actually even fall, finds its way inside the church. And this is what we're going to be dealing with in the passage today. And we're also going to be talking not just about following uh, moral laws, but also just following the word of the Lord in terms of acting rightly or, or thinking rightly about God. So there's um, the theological questions that we need to, to grapple with, uh, especially if we're coming into contact with different people, maybe maybe even within our own congregations, that are thinking differently about a theological subject. But um, let's get into the text itself. So we're looking into 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 22, ending verse 26. So this is finishing out the chapter. And it really is continuing on what came before. So the last half of 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, it's looking into, well, you're not supposed to be engaging in uh, disputes or especially worthless disputes, as Paul uh, calls them. These are the discussions that are not talking about what we can find in Christ per se, and these are also the things that actually detract us from finding and worth in Christ, finding the blessings of Christ, because they're actually trying to bring us out of Christ. So um, St. Paul is is directing Timothy, well, for these things, you're supposed to be um, uh, removing these stupid discussions. Uh, and yeah, so so Paul's saying like, yeah, th this is compromising faith, so they're, they're horrible, worthless, stupid. Uh, so he's saying, well, you're supposed to be taking these outside of the church because you have to properly instruct the people who are here. So the only way to do that is to better educate people in the faith, better instruct them, or to remove the heretics from among us, which is also one of the options, which Paul gets into a little bit with metaphor in verses 20 and 21, right before uh, the passage that we're going to be focused on today. Uh, so let's get into... Verse 22, go to the end of the chapter. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with the foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. So this, this little bit begins with, Flee the evil desires of youth. What is Paul talking about? So he's, he's starting off with a very forceful command, an imperative. You're supposed to flee these things. You're supposed to go away as hard as you possibly can. So don't have anything to do with them. Just run. That's the idea. So you're immediately supposed to separate yourself from these as if they, you were, well, uh, I guess you... I guess the metaphor is uh, if you're if you're in your childhood, it may be a, a, a big dog in a yard that you're running from. So something like that, something that really frightened you. So you're like, no, I don't want to be that in that part of my youth. But what does Paul mean by youth? Well, he's putting this in opposition to righteousness, faith, love, and peace. So what is he getting at? Well, he's getting at uh, youthfulness in terms of, well being kind of, a, as, as we would understand, a hot-headed teenager. So it's the typical stereotype where you have a teenager who is just doing all the wrong things because 
they're a teenager. And the reason why it's a stereotype is that we find a lot of people following into the, falling into this stereotype where they're just a rebellious teen. And the rebellion is actually going to be what is more pertinent to this. Uh, and it's, it's part of growing up too, is you're trying to learn your place in society and you're trying to learn your place, especially as you're growing up, you're developing, you're becoming uh, an adult in society. So you're taking on more responsibility. But if you're taking on more responsibility, that means that you're taking away the, some of the responsibility of other people who've been your guardians. So namely your father and your mother. Um, so when you're a teenager, you're, you're rebelling against authorities and these are going to be more parental authorities or, or the different guardians you may have as a, as a, a young person. And the idea is that, yeah, you're actually trying to uh, push some boundaries, trying to establish yourself as an adult, and you're also trying to take some, some more authority for yourself, trying to direct your own life a little bit more. And this is kind of an ongoing negotiation conversation. So uh, if you do have a good relationship with your parents, uh, the rebelliousness as a teenager won't actually be terribly rebellious because the teenager will just have a nice, peaceful um, uh, obtaining of power, shifting of power so that they actually have more control of their lives. And if the parent is done, well, their job as a parent, so raise this raise this child to actually take responsibility and, and know how to, how to work with it, then they can actually trust their child like, oh, okay, well, you, I know that you can handle this and you can do well with that. So uh, I can, even, I can help you or I can encourage you, but here, you can do this now. And uh, yeah, we, we see this with normal child development where uh, children will be taking control of more chores so that they've learned how to work around in the house. Uh, they, they start earning income. So they go out, have a job, they, they, um, learn to drive and whatnot so that they have a little bit more mobility, more freedom. Um, and this is what we see in youth. That, yeah, they, they're trying to take on more of themselves. But when you go into the um, poor side of this, uh, the less morally upright part of this, where you have just rebellion, it's all well, the teenager is just horrible to those who are in authority around them. They're trying to establish more authority for themselves, more presence for themselves, more popularity for themselves, so that they're uh, tearing down people around them. So there's actually um, a danger of this person sinning and sinning because they're normally developing. And again, you're normally developing as you, as you transition to becoming an adult by trying to take care of yourself. But if you, if you don't have a good way to, to manage that, then yeah, you're going to be utterly obnoxious or, or, um, or um, I guess you could say um, abusive with your language or even violent with, with your fists. Like there's, there's a reason why some people are concerned about teenagers. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. You just have some of these outlandish events happening. So what Paul seems to be saying is, well, the evil desires of youth, so in as a youth, when you're starting to try to covet authority a bit more, um, maybe he also has in here uh, trying to um, covet more human beings, so there's a bit of lust there. Uh, so flee from these things and rather pursue righteousness. So, what, so why is Paul saying pursue righteousness? And uh, I'll say that pursue is actually also in parallel with flee. So as you're trying to flee the evil desires of youth, as you're trying to run away from these as fast as you can, you're also trying to run as fast as you can to, well, the virtues that we have as Christians. So Paul is saying pursue righteousness, uh, fly towards righteousness, look to what is right and good and actually do those things. And this is what we hope to do, is that we don't want to be left within our own um, self-absorbed circle where we're trying to just work out what's best for us at, at the cost of everybody around us. What we actually want to do is we want to actually help those around us and live a morally upright lifestyle. So this is, this is righteousness, everything in right accord with one another and actually uh, working well together. And then Paul also says, uh, pursue faith. So what does he mean by pursue faith? 
well, we, we do know that faith is the living, breathing um, relationship that you have with the Father, fellowship that you have with God uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord as sustained by the Holy Spirit. So this is the way that we receive uh, all the blessings of God, uh, all the graces of God. So how do we have a stronger faith? Well, that's not exactly what Paul's talking about, because if we're already receiving all the graces of God by way of faith, then why, why would we need to strengthen faith? Uh, so the idea of, of Paul encouraging you to pursue faith, well, what's, what's the matter of faith? Well the, well, the object of faith specifically is Christ our Lord. So if we're trying to live in the faith, this actually has something to do with righteousness, where we're trying to look to less of ourselves and more unto God, seeing, well, what do we need to do in the faith? And that's more what Paul's getting at. It's like, well, what are you doing in the faith? It's not your, your fellowship of faith with God per se, but it is the faith. How are you living in the Christian faith? How are you being a Christian? And here we can actually pursue this work on it and we can actually think, well, yeah, well, we need to go to church on a regular basis. We need to regularly receive God's word. So maybe even do some devotionals or devotional studies, watch some devotional studies done by a pastor. Cough, cough. Anyways, um, and you can also be going to receive the sacrament uh, readily, uh, uh, regularly. Uh, so uh, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Lord's Supper. And you can also, you know, try to talk with more Christians, encourage more Christians and have them encourage you to live in the faith. So there's many things that we can do. Uh, next up is uh, love. So pursue love. Well, this isn't, this isn't love so much as uh, the emotion, because that's usually what people think of when they're pursuing love, especially in our day and age, as we're, as we're looking at, say, um, uh, rom-coms or anything like that where it's okay well you have to pursue this person who's the object of your affections and you're trying to just love love and, and be as loving as you can that's not exactly what's going on with when paul's saying this because that is still very much an emotional type of love uh, what paul is really getting at is he's trying to get at the sacrificial love of christianity so it is not an emotional love per se but it is a, a, an action-oriented love. So our action-oriented love is the love of sacrifice. And this is what we see in Christ himself. So when Jesus says in John chapter 15 that there is no greater love that when uh, a man lays down his life for his friends, um, or t t technically he says one, but it's a masculine, but it's, yeah, so men, man or woman, whenever you, you personally, lay down your life for your friends, like this is imitating Christ, because that's what Christ did for us. He laid down his life for us at the cross, that we might be saved. So uh, when you're giving of yourself sacrificially, when you're being a living sacrifice unto the Lord, you are actually trying to love your neighbor. You're trying to do what is best for them. You're willing to, to let go of your time, your effort, your t uh, maybe even your money, resources, uh, whatever you have, you're, you're actually trying to give this in sacrifice to somebody else. So you're not, you're not looking towards your own self-interest, but you're actually trying to take into account, well, what's better for, for this person? What can I do for them rather than look to me right now? So that's more what love is. So pursue, um, the sacrifice, the loving sacrifice of helping others. And the last, the last thing that Paul says here is, uh, peace. So pursue peace. And what's peace? Well, again, I, I've said this in many, many devotionals uh, that I've recorded, but uh, peace in the scriptures is not defined negatively. And this is what, how we usually define peace nowadays. This is just what people default to, where they say, well, uh, peace is not having any conflict, not having arguments. So it is peaceful when it's not in, in, in war, really. But that's not how the scriptures really use the word peace, because peace in the scriptures is actually being in relation to blessing. It, yes, of course, there's no war conflict. Uh, there's also no sin in relation to peace. So what we're actually seeing in peace is um, living without this conflict. And what does that actually look like? 
And when you start saying, well, what does it actually look like to live without conflict, without struggle uh, against sin, like people sinning against me or me against my own personal sins? And you go, well, that means that I am not having any guilt or obsession. I'm actually just free to do what I want to do. I'm free to live rightly. I'm free to uh, act towards my neighbors as a, a wish. There's nothing impeding me. I can actually do what I want to do in creation. And that's more peace, is that, uh, as, as understood in the scriptures, is you participating in uh, the peace of Christ, the reconciliation with the Father, where you can just live as he wants you to live. And of course, this is also defined by, say, righteousness, where righteousness puts us in right relation to our, to God, our neighbors. It is defining more of the action, uh, the actions that we do uh, in the state of peace, but the state of peace is just coming about with us existing in this world well. Okay. So uh, how do we pursue that? Well, that's a little bit difficult because it's like, well, how do we, how do we avoid all conflict? Hmm, that, that's difficult. But it really is lined with, well, how do we avoid conflict? Because conflict is what disrupts peace. So what do we, what do, we do how, and how do we do it uh, so that we may uh, live peacefully in this world? And, and that's what we need to think about for this, for pursuing peace. So uh, St. Paul, he's, verse 22 still, he says, Flee the evil desires of youth, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So he's saying, we're not doing this alone, we're doing this with everybody else. And of course, St. Paul, he's speaking to Timothy right now because this is a letter to Timothy. But we can also think, well, yeah, if, if we're trying to do this, we're doing it in relation to everybody else, even St. Timothy of old. So... Uh, we're doing this, calling upon the Lord out of a pure heart. So if we're trying to live rightly, the only way that we can live rightly is with God, because we're still sinners. We still find the evil tensions within ourselves, the coveting, the lust, and we have to flee these desires of youth. And if we're even uh, drawing out the scope of this to eternal life, well, our youth could be the entire lives that we live in this world, because even though this could be... Um, uh, an 80 year span or even by reason 90 or even more than that uh, this would be just a mere pittance in terms of time when we relate this to eternal life so in eternal life well like we are constantly in righteousness constantly in the fellowship of faith with our lord constantly living rightly in the faith uh constantly loving and willing to give up ourselves towards others and this will be peaceful this will be in the new heavens, new earth with our Lord. So, um, if we're pursuing this, if we're calling on the name of the Lord, we're doing this with a pure heart because that's the only way to do it. Because if we're relying on uh, our own personal desires, well, it's going to be going towards our sinful nature, the sinful heart rather than the pure heart. The pure heart is that which is renewed by Christ so that we actually might live rightly. So not trying to pursue these things out of our self-interest, not trying to help our neighbors out of self-interest, which is what we see in the world all the time. It's like people are like, yeah, well, well we have to pay attention to so-and-so or help so-and-so. And sometimes that's just that person just trying to get fame or fortune or, or something else. So we see this all the time. But really what we want is to do this with a pure heart where God is constantly renewing us so that we may genuinely, selflessly love our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, so, yeah, and in part, that's why we have to call on the Lord, is that he constantly renews us, constantly giving us uh, righteousness and a new life so that we may do what is right. Uh, verse 23. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. So, in my previous devotion, where I was looking at the verses before this and dealing with different arguments in the church, I mentioned uh, a particular case that I heard about where there was basically a division within a congregation and a dissolution of a congregation because of an argument over an air conditioner. And I can actually believe that. I've, I've seen many different arguments where there's a, a cause that doesn't seem to be of any particular issue, but 
for some reason, people just get heated over it. If there's a division within uh, the councils that are, and committees that are discussing this. There's even division within the entirety of the congregation as people start taking sides. And yeah, it can be a huge mess over something that has no real import over the Christian faith. Um, I also have heard of a congregation, um, I won't name names, but one congregation, uh, they were constantly bickering over their building. They were having a lot of issues with it, and uh, they they didn't have the finances to take care of it, especially with whatever issues that it had. And then eventually what happened was they decided to, to uh, sell the building. And I don't know how many people voted which way, but at least a majority sold the building. And uh, then the then the group packed up and then started worshiping at a, at a rental space, uh, or well, space they were renting anyways. And the building itself eventually uh, moved on to another Christian group. So you, would, you might expect, well, all the bickering to continue, but really what happened was uh, the people since the main issue was trying to decide what to do with the building, without the building, there was no cause for argument anymore, and the people could actually uh, resolve the issues among them. And then they're like, "Ah, we're at peace now. We don't need to. We need to argue over these things. We can just focus on Christ and live in worship." And yeah, that was how they avoided that, if you will, according, using Paul's word, a foolish and stupid argument. In so far as that could have actually divided Christians. Christian brothers and sisters over something that had nothing to do in the faith. But when we're looking at these words, as Paul, bring, as Paul is bringing them up, foolish and stupid arguments, um, this isn't dealing so much with uh, those types of issues that arise that have nothing to do with faith, but these are the issues that are actually in faith. So uh, the first word there, and I was looking this up, uh, foolish it actually is... Uh, moros, or uh, where we get the English word moronic. So it is like kind of a stupid thing that happens, like there's no intelligence in it. Um, that comes up in a couple different places, and uh, in Paul's works, in Paul's works, his, his letters, and you can't really get too much direction in that, but we do get a little bit more direction in the other word, where it's translated here in the NIV as stupid. So what is stupid is? Well, it's uninstructed. And that appears only once in the entirety of the Bible, only here. Uh, but it's uninstructed. And that helps bring a better context to this, where Paul is saying, like, don't, don't go into the arguments where people are basically arguing from ignorance over the faith. So these are... And Paul is speaking directly to Timothy, Timothy being a bishop, the guy who's supposed to be instructing people. And this is why Paul is bringing up in uh, verse uh, 25, uh, instruct in the hope of God. Uh, he's also, and he's saying, yeah, gently instruct them. Uh, he's speaking specifically to Timothy as a teacher in the church. So the arguments that Paul is actually talking about are those that are coming from an ignorance of the faith, matters of faith. And we can we can list a whole bunch of different types of these things. So Paul's saying, like, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. And he doesn't say, like, specifically this, that, and the other thing. So we have to basically think, well, what, what arguments could we have theologically? And um, not too far earlier, he had mentioned in verse 18 there, that there are two individuals that say that the resurrection has already taken place. And this is, this is uh, part of the view known as preterism. Preterism is saying that everything prophesied in the Bible already happened at the time the Bible was being written, more or less, so that there's nothing left to fulfill, everything is already done, at which point you go, well, where the new heavens, new earth, they're not here yet. Uh, where is the, the absolute destruction of death? People are still dying. So, so the idea is really breaks down the faith because it's saying, well, everything's already fulfilled when 
we haven't seen it fulfilled and then people are going okay well if it's not happening to me either the problem's me or the problem's with the faith so if the people are thinking it's a problem with the faith well it's like well it makes absolutely no sense therefore uh who cares about this christ person and then they go off into unbelief and if they're thinking that the problem is themselves it's like well if if there's supposed to be new heavens new earth and i'm not seeing this if there's supposed to be a resurrection from the dead or, or, or perfection of the flesh and i am still suffering and disease and and threatened with death well then the then I must not be believing hard enough and I must be outside of the faith. And then people that way, uh, they, actually, they actually fall away from the faith because they think that they're not good enough somehow. So, uh, yeah, we, we can see this in some of the foolish and stupid arguments where, where people are putting forward a position which is basically, basically causing you to question your faith. And uh, if, we, if we go by that definition, we can bring out a wider context than what Paul has here, where he's talking about uh, the people who are saying that Christ's resurrection has already happened. Uh, and I mean, the resurrection of Christ has already happened, like everybody's already resurrected. Because uh, Christ definitely did rise from the grave. Like, our, the entirety of the Christian faith belongs to it, belongs to that belief. So if we're, if we're thinking through, well, what issues do we have? Well, St. John actually talks about these things in his works and uh, sp specifically in first John we see uh, John saying well this is where you're in the faith or you're outside of the faith and John is saying you're in you're in the faith basically if you believe in the Trinity now of course first John doesn't really spell that out explicitly but you can see that because John is saying well you need to believe in the Father rightly you need to believe in Jesus Christ rightly and then you also have to be of the right spirit so basically john is looking towards the trinity so where are you in the understanding of father son holy spirit and john is also saying that letter well you need to believe that jesus came from the father so you have the divine nature and john also says um, uh, all those who believe that jesus christ came in the flesh is of the spirit of the holy spirit so you have uh, the two natures of christ so trinity the incarnation, proper understanding of that. And then we also have uh, John talking about uh, salvation through grace, through faith. So we, so he talks about that a bit, and uh, also in the letter he's, he's talking about, well, this is acting rightly in the faith. So it's, you're receiving this by, you're receiving salvation by grace through faith, but in the faith, now that you are saved, you're actually going to be acting rightly towards your brothers, uh, your brothers and sisters in the faith, namely, but towards all people. And John is saying, well, if you don't love your brother and brothers and sisters, like this isn't exclusive to gender. So if you don't love the people around you, don't try to love them as Christ loved us, then you're not of God because you're not uh, living as Christ lived and is giving himself to you. So if, you, if you're receiving Christ's grace, but you're not living this out, if you're not living out this in faith, then you're not in God because you keep turning to your sin. You keep focusing on your sin instead of focusing on God. Uh, John also in that letter is saying uh, in chapter one that if you, if you say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So John is not saying, well, yeah, you have to be perfectly sinless in the faith. Otherwise, as soon as you sin, you're, you're, you're damned. That's not what John is saying. But what John is saying is that if you continue on in sin, if you don't constantly turn back to God, if you don't constantly repent of your sin, if you don't look for salvation in Christ and actually struggle against sin, uh, if you're just fine with sin, if you're fine with, the, with what the world offers, if, if you don't care about sinning, you don't care about sin, then you're not of the faith. That's basically what John is getting at. So uh, these, these are the criteria uh, that I look to. Trinity, understanding of the person of Christ, and salvation by grace through faith. So these, these things basically determine who's a Christian and who's not. And we can see that very, very clearly with some of the early heresies where the church made significant divisions saying, you're out and because you don't believe rightly. Uh, so there's quite a few different, different ones going on towards the beginning. And um, shortly after John was writing, you have 
uh, what he was writing against kind of morph into its own religion. This was Gnosticism, which was saying that Jesus actually, in fact, did not come in the flesh. He, or he did not uh, rise from the flesh. Uh, there's different forms of Gnosticism. But Jesus appeared as spirit. Only spirit is good, flesh is evil. Therefore, Jesus Christ was not preaching the resurrection. Uh, in the flesh, he was preaching uh, freedom from uh, the flesh so that you could just be spiritual body somewhere else. Now, uh, so yeah, that's, that's one of these issues that we have to fight against. And I actually even hear that now, every now and again. Uh, there was um, a fellow I encountered in, um, in one prayer service I had where he commented to me afterwards because I was preaching on the resurrection of Christ. Uh, it was around Easter. So I was preaching like, yes, this is the physical resurrection of Christ. This is what we see in the scriptures. This is, this is what uh, we have to believe in because we who are raised, uh, or, yeah, we who are raised in the flesh, we are raised because Christ was raised. So yeah, it's always promising resurrection of Christ that way. And this fellow kind of in passing said, well, I don't believe in physical resurrection. I think it was a spiritual resurrection. And yeah, I, I couldn't really get more out of him, but like it was... It was insane because he's basically denying the whole of the Christian faith the past past two thousand years, and he's going towards Gnosticism, which is which is outside of the faith, because um, it's not understanding who Christ truly is, who is both God and man. So when Christ was raised from the dead, he was raised as man. Uh, but yeah, there's been many many heresies that have denied this. Uh, Gnosticism being the first one, you also have uh, Armstrongianism. Um, in the last century, it's kind of died out for the most part. But yeah, they were also saying, well, Jesus Christ uh, rose from the dead and he only appeared to have a body. Um, but, and even though Armstrongism is gone, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses also believe that and they're still around. So it is very much a cultic belief. Now I'll go with uh, kind of a Trinitarian one. And um, a little bit later on in church history, you have... Uh, Arianism come up, and Arianism was the belief that Jesus was created in some way, not just his human side was created because that was taken from the Virgin Mary. Like we, everybody agrees that yeah, that that is having what is proper proper to the qualities of human flesh that it came to be some point in time. But what Arianism is saying is that Jesus' spiritual nature came to be. At some point in eternity, that uh, before before this world began, uh, God the Father created God the Son, so that in effect they are two different beings. You see this in Arianism in the well, it kind of began in the third century A.D., but uh, it really hit a major discussion point in the fourth century, where you have the Council of Nicaea, which is actually declaring this to be heresy and and saying that if you do, if you believe in this, you're outside of salvation. So what, uh, yeah, because it's basically denying God, because God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, neither confusing the persons nor, nor uh, separating out the divinity. So uh, we need to know who is actually saving us. And that, so uh, when I even went with the, uh, when I was talking about Gnosticism, where you have to actually believe the resurrection happened, where Jesus Christ was in the flesh, raised in the flesh, because yeah, if Jesus Christ only raised spiritually, then your flesh is forever damned, because that won't be saved. So Jesus Christ has to raise us up. Similarly, if you're praying to a God who's not Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God in unity, then you're praying to another God. You're praying to somebody else. Uh, this is basically what the Arians uh, were doing, because even though... A, Towards the beginning of the discussion, they were saying, no, no, Father and Son, we're, we're still one God united. Uh, after a while, they actually realized and thought through to the logical conclusion, which is, no, they're actually two very separate deities. And that's basically where it leads you. And even today, we see this in, say, uh, Mormonism cause, and Jehovah's Witnesses, but uh, say like Mormonism, where Mormonism believes in three completely separate deities, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're not one God, they're three. The three independent deities and uh, even though Jesus Christ brought has brought about salvation um, yeah he is he is not one with the Father nor is he one with the Holy Spirit they're all three different persons so Mormonism actually worships a completely different God and putting that forward to its 
to its logical conclusion, where it's basically that anybody who participates in Christ can actually, uh, to the extent of being a Mormon, can can reach his level of divinity, then you find Mormonism actually preaching that there's as many gods as there are Mormons, at, at the very least. Because, because of Mormon theology, there's actually potentially even more, more gods even before God the Father, and there will be even more gods after the Mormons become uh, gods themselves in their theology. Because if they're, if they're creating their own worlds like God the Father, where they could have even more potentially more potential gods, then theoretically Mormonism can have an infinite amount of gods as uh, eternity works its way out. So yes, uh, Mormonism is not Christianity. It is believing something very different. Um, and then lastly, salvation by grace of faith. Like this was a major contention of uh, the Reformation, where the Reformation was basically trying to um, hammer out all the details in terms of justification. Well, how are we, how are we saved through faith? And uh, Catholicism basically came down to faith plus works, saves you. And Eastern Orthodoxy also believes something relatively similar. Uh, they go about it very different ways, but relatively similar. Uh, whereas <clears throat> Lutheranism and and the, the Protestant movements, I'm not necessarily counting Lutherans and Protestants, uh, because we're different from quite a few of those churches. <clears throat> but within our view, it's like, no, well, the, the scriptures clearly say you were saved by grace through faith, and that's Ephesians 2.8. Um, so you are saved by, faith, by grace, and uh, if, you, if you speak to Catholics as well as Orthodox, they'll say the same thing. It's like, you are saved by grace, but for them, you need to stay in that, that salvation to some extent by way of your works. You need to continue doing those to continue on in salvation. Um, uh, the scriptural viewpoint that I'm seeing is, you know, you're saved by grace, and even though you are continuing on in works because grace working itself out in you by way of faith, is actually producing works like you can't separate these things and we and we would agree with uh, catholics and, and orthodox on that like if you're in the faith you're doing you have to do works like this this is all over the place in scripture but the distinction is well those works have no part to play in your salvation so you're actually saved by faith so a continuous flow of grace through faith is what's actually saving you your works don't save you they've never saved you they won't save you um, but you, you need to live this out. So uh, all Christians still believe that you're saved by grace and that grace will produce works. But yeah, you, you, there, there was an issue, particularly with uh, a heresy called Pelagianism. Uh, this was kind of at the turn of the fifth century where uh, Pelagius, a monk in, in uh, the British Isles, he was talking about how um, you're not necessarily saved by grace, but by imitating Christ. And in this imitation of Christ, so you choosing to do uh, good works, uh, try to live like Christ, try to take on his righteousness, uh, well, God will forgive the rest, but your, your, your coming into uh, salvation is dependent on you. And, uh, yeah, the, the Western Church had to respond to this, and this was St. Augustine who was writing against this, and he was basically defining um, the, the understanding of original sin, sin, which is inherited so that all people are sinful we don't we don't just choose for our salvation but we're all damned before god brings us out of this sinful estate this this death and sin as saint paul also says in ephesians chapter 2 we are all you're all dead in your trespasses and sins uh, all of us were so it's only by grace through faith that we actually come to new life uh, and and the issue with this is you're actually trying to work for your salvation. And St. Paul actually talks about this um, a fair amount in the book of Romans, particularly Romans 10, uh, and some in 11, some in 9. Uh, but Paul is saying, well, there are so many Jews who aren't saved, but they've all heard the word of the gospel in the Old Testament, and these people are hearing about Jesus today, so why are there so many that, that aren't saved? 
And Paul made the distinction that it was those who were saved without work, so they just believe and they are saved. Whereas there are those who still try to work for salvation. They still try to do the works of the law for their salvation. And Paul's saying, well, you have worked, but you have not obtained. Whereas those who are, whereas those who are chosen, like called by God, they are already saved. They've already obtained salvation. Whereas, yeah, if you keep working, what you're actually doing is you're rejecting Christ because this is grace. This is a free gift. So if you're not accepting it as a free gift, if, if you see this as a free gift and you're like, okay, well, I still have to work for my salvation, then you're actually saying your salvation isn't free. It is still yours. You have to choose this. You have to work for it in some way. So there's um, Pelagianism. There's also semi-Pelagianism, which says that initially you're saved by grace, but you need to work for your salvation. And uh, that's kind of been adopted by uh, different groups uh, over time to varying degrees but it's still very prevalent where you, where you have these things being worked out today in fact uh, there's so many discussions i have with people like even within the christian church where they're saying well no you have to do xyz like whatever works that they have in mind you have to do these things in order to be saved where, where i'm saying like no you don't see that anywhere in scripture is always saying you are saved by grace christ has saved you so look at all the verbs that say save who's saving you and what is the basis of that salvation? It's always God's good grace, and it's always by grace you are saved. It, it's never, never because of your works you are saved. Yeah. Anyway, so going into depth on that, like these are examples, of course, that we might have. So if you're actually going, if you're talking in the church and people are actually denying some of the fundamental um, ideas of salvation, I'll say again, Trinity, person of Christ, Salvation by grace. People are calling these into question and they're arguing with you about it in the church. Well, yeah, you can say that these are foolish and stupid arguments and they are breaking down the congregation in, in quarrels. And this is what a lot of false preachers want to do. So not necessarily people coming in as Christians uh, and trying to submit to Christ's teachings in the scriptures, but the, these are the people who are going like, aha, I have the, I have the new understanding of scripture that that is not taught by the Christian church, but I have to save the Christian church from itself. Salvation and great in Christ. No, I have to teach it a new, new teaching. Yeah, those are the people who are coming in and it's all about them, really. So you, so you can tell false preachers pretty easily because they try to make it all about themselves. But a lot of the time what we'll find to be the problem is somebody within the congregation who has a bad idea, a, a wrong idea, wrong theology. And this isn't necessarily just because they're trying to put attention on themselves. Uh, maybe somebody is. I, like I've actually encountered somebody who tried to come into my own congregation one time who did try to make it all about him. Like, there were some issues there. But uh, thankfully he was doing it kind of off, off in his own shadow. So. It, so it wasn't uh, uh, damaging for the congregation. But there are some people who just have some impression of the faith that is incorrect, is inconsistent with the scriptures, and then they bring it forward, uh, trying to, trying to uh, talk with the pastor. Hopefully, hopefully they're having this out with the pastor before they bring it to anybody else in the congregation. But um, they'll talk with the pastor. Maybe they bring it to other people in the congregation, and they say, well, uh, well, did God really say that he came, that he's a, one God in three persons, or did he really come in the flesh, or something like that? And uh, this does happen from time to time, where you do get somebody in the church like that. In fact, uh, the fellow that I mentioned earlier that that I that I heard after a prayer service, like he he was basically telling me that he's been a lifelong Christian, that he that he was uh, in the Anglican Church for a long, long time. And uh, he was even uh, criticizing my service because we were using uh, actual historical translation of the Apostles' Creed, because the Apostles' Creed has in there, uh, I believe in the one Christian faith, uh, in it, the, the word Christian there, uh, in the original Greek can be translated as, as Catholic, and sometimes it is, in small c Catholic, so not, not uh, Roman Catholicism, but uh, Catholic in terms of universal church. Um, but there's a German variant, and since Lutherans come from Germany, uh, the Germans, like a couple centuries even before the Reformation, uh, have been translating this as one holy Christian church. Because 
Christianity is the universal religion of, of our religion, like that this is it. Um, so the fellow took, took issue with that, said like, oh, no, it was just Reformation stuff, and even though it happened a couple of centuries earlier, um, uh, back when they were still part of the Roman Catholic Church. In any case, uh, he was saying like, oh, well, you, you don't say the Apostles' Creed correctly, this is, this is horrible. But I'm, and then he goes and denies one of the central tenets of the Christian faith, the, the thing that St. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, defines Christianity, and if Christ has not been raised from the dead, if his body has not been raised from the dead, then we're dead in our sins and trespasses, and the entirety of the faith is futile. So he's denying basically the faith, but taking issue with the wording of the Apostles' Creed, which he also doesn't believe in if he doesn't believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead physically. So uh, these people are there. Sometimes they make their their issues known. Sometimes they don't. I, I really doubt he actually voiced this within whatever congregation that he was in. But yeah, it, it's one of those issues is if this person is coming, if they're if they're starting to discuss this with people, they can actually start these, again, foolish, or if you would say, uneducated or uninstructed ideas where they're, where they're just not presenting the honesty of the faith, uh, the truthfulness of the faith. So this is where you get um, St. Paul ad advising Timothy. So we're moving on to verse 24 now. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. So, Paul is saying, the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Who is he meaning? Specifically, Timothy. So, he's advising Timothy right now. And Timothy is representative of the clergy, and this is more what Paul's talking about. He's saying, well, the leaders of the church, they're not supposed to, to advance this. Uh, it also continues on in verse 25, where, where he says, uh, those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. So, the servant, he must instruct. So Paul is talking to Timothy as one who is a leader in the church. So he's he's definitely a, a pastor, priest, specifically a bishop at this time because he's an overseer of many different churches, even though the words overseer and, and, uh, and pastor are still kind of one and the same at this point in time in the scriptures because Paul uses them interchangeably in the book of Titus, which is written even just a couple of well, maybe a couple of years. It's hard to really date the books. But around the same time as Second Timothy. In any case, um, even though this is, this is directed towards clergy in terms of how to lead the congregation, people within the congregation can still advise others in the congregation, like, hey, well, no, we, we should look at, look at the scriptures and we should actually let this be our guide instead of, instead of uh, whatever idea you might have. Because usually when you start pressing people on it, they, they start trying to make exceptions to the scriptures or reword them or, or say it doesn't mean what it means, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I've gotten into this conversation many, many times uh, with different people on different viewpoints. Say like with um, uh, baptism, baptism actually saving you. There have been people who actually denied that even though it's explicitly written in, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. I've also gotten into conversations with uh, people who allow women's ordination where they just kind of say where this is denied in Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2. They just deny that those texts should mean what they mean. And, and when I tell them, like, no, they actually mean what they mean, they say, oh, well, no, we, we shouldn't take St. Paul as an authority in the church. Like, we can just ignore that now. And, and it's like, no, you're just denying Scripture. Um, and those are some small issues, but yeah, you, you also confront people who actually believe in some of the bigger heresies uh, where, where they're denying, say, like the physical resurrection of Christ, and usually those people like rip entire books out of the Bible. Um, this was one of the issues with um, the early heresies where they were just saying, like, no, we can't pay attention to any of the books, uh, any of these books that deny my position. Uh, Marcionism was a heresy that was known for this, where, where they... Uh, only accepted as their Bible. Like they rejected the Old Testament completely. They rejected most of the New Testament. So they only had in their Bible um, uh, seven letters of Paul and about um, half, of, half of Luke. Uh, that, that was that heresy. And then the, the Christian church, the actual Christians, had to address this saying like, no, no, this isn't what we've known to be true. This isn't what the apostles taught we have the actual apostolic writings. So we have the New Testament. We also have, 
of them saying that the Old Testament is authoritative scripture. Jesus says that it's authoritative scripture. Therefore, we have to look at the whole Bible. Now, uh, as for the actual canonization of scripture, that happened a little bit later, but still you have people going like, no, we, we have the Bible, you have to believe in God's word, even from the beginning. And when people are saying like, no, we have to ignore parts of the Bible. So, um, yeah, you, you, uh, you might not be a, a, a pastor in the church or maybe even an elder in the church, but you can still point to God's word and say like, hey, he says this. And for anybody who, who uh, you feel you cannot address, you can always direct them to the pastor, make them known to the pastor so that your pastor may deal with this as, as they can and hopefully will. So, uh, verse 24, which says, And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. In the city must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. What Paul is saying here is the goal in confronting those who are speaking falsely in the church, our goal is not just to argue. That's not the point. And we as simple preachers, yeah, we definitely can argue. Uh, if, you, if you look at theological discussions online, like I've, I've uh, uh, since I've been here at the church, I... You've had to go onto Facebook uh, just so that I can manage things. And I've learned not to go onto Facebook because it's pretty useless. Uh, because when you ever, whenever I go on there, I, I, the only thing that has real meaning for me on Facebook, uh, aside from a couple small things, is theology. So I, I go to different theological uh, pages and groups. And what I learned is, yeah, people have a whole bunch of quarrels online and it doesn't really go anywhere. Because uh, sometimes people just completely ignore you reading scripture word for word, and they'll act like you, it it doesn't say that. Um, and really, what it ends up being is is a complete waste of your time and your efforts, and you are better spent elsewhere to actually building up the church rather than speaking to this person who won't refuse and absolutely refuses to. So this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter seven, where he says. Don't, I'm forgetting the first part of it. Uh, don't put your pearls before a swine. As is the part that is coming to mind. Uh, yeah, don't give the dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to the pig. So don't, get, don't throw your pearls to swine. Um, Jesus' point in saying that, and he's saying that within the context of uh, false teachers within the church. He's saying, don't use what is sacred, but like what you've been entrusted to in the faith. Don't use that and just keep throwing it to these people who are abusing it, because they're never going to actually appreciate this, and they're never going to do anything with it. So what we're actually cautioned to do is proclaim the word, but proclaim to the word to people who actually listen. So if you talk to the people who absolutely refuse to listen, well, Guess what? You, it's not really up to you to convert that person, at least not at that time. So your efforts are better spent elsewhere. Go turn elsewhere where you can actually use the gifts God has given you to good effect. You're not made to quarrel. You're made to bring peace and good news. Like God has called you to spread the good news of Jesus Christ and salvation in his name. So this is what we should be doing. So don't waste your time in a situation of quarreling when you're, you can be better suited elsewhere. So verse 25 here is, uh, those who oppose him, that is the servant of Christ, uh, the, uh, the clergy specifically, but we can also say to a degree anybody who's trying to preach the word. <clears throat> so those who oppose him, he, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. So yes, of course, here when Paul's mentioning like, grant them repentance. Like this is actual sins against God. So this isn't uh, just um, any issue that you have in the church. Maybe you're arguing over uh, the building itself. Like uh, should we wait until such and such a time to replace the furnace Like and have an argument over that? Uh, that's not what Paul sp specifically is talking about. What he's talking about is issues over doctrine more specifically. And then we can also say even issues over morality and how to do good works around us because we should be doing good works as Christians. We should be following the law. And if we're not following the law, well, then we're not displaying the love of Christ to our neighbors because this is how we display the love of Christ to our neighbors. Christ has given us his love by way of his cross and this enlivens and preserves us in the faith. So now we're supposed to go out and actually show this love to others, show this sacrificial love to others, not 
not ourselves necessarily being crucified on the cross. Some people have been, but we are going out there so that we may offer of ourselves to help others in Christ's name. So um, that's, that's the overall goal. But if people are not living rightly in Christ, so they're denying uh, God's God's commands in the scriptures. So people are, say, like uh, sleeping around, they're lying about things, they're, they're um, uh, st- let's say, uh, stealing movies and online or something, they're being dishonest about what Netflix account they're actually watching, etc., etc. Well, that's not really living as a Christian because you're violating a number of different commandments there. So what you want is somebody who will honestly live out the faith. So if somebody is doing that, then rebuke them. If they say, no, this is this is the way Christians should act, which I really hope they don't because that doesn't make any sense and it's against all sorts of, or, all sorts of passages that we could drop. Um, then you basically, uh, well, the order is according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 18. So if you go and confront your neighbor according to their sin, um, and they deny you, then you bring a few witnesses. So you bring other people in the church, you say, look, you bring them to this person and say, hey, look, we, we all agree this is what the Bible says. This is what you're not doing. You should actually repent of your sins, stop doing these things. And that person uh, disagrees still. You bring it to the attention of the church and say, hey, church, this person is sinning, sinning publicly. They're not repenting. We have to, we have to excommunicate this person because they're actually just negatively impacting our congregation because now people are thinking that that's okay. Now, of course, that isn't necessarily the case every single time because there could be somebody who attends in worship who is not making it public, so you don't necessarily have to excommunicate them because excommunication is to address public sins, uh, sins that everybody knows. But if somebody is attending church doing sins privately, it, it should be at least brought up to the pastor so that the pastor can confront this person and if they're still... Uh, performing their sin and saying that no, this is right, and they're not, we're not struggling against it, and they're not saying that this is wrong. Um, then, according to First John, the letter of First John, which is saying that these people who hate their brothers, like they have no part with us, they're, they're not in Christ. Well, then this, then the pastor can give them what's called a minor ban, so they're not receiving the Lord's supper because that would actually be received to that person's harm because they're coming into the presence of God as an unrepentant sinner and in the presence of. And God, in his presence, he will strike down sin. Unrepentant sinners, they will be struck down. So what they would actually be doing coming forward to receive the Lord's Supper would be receiving judgment, not grace. It's so only penitent sinners, people who acknowledge their sins. Because all everybody who goes up to the Lord's Supper, all of us are sinners. But those who are coming to receive it, they should be penitent. They should go, like, I'm struggling against this sin. Maybe, I, maybe you've fallen to pray to this sin at some point in time, but you still... Say, like, I'm a sinner, I need this forgiveness. So so you are repenting. So that's the person who needs to receive the supper because they want to receive forgiveness and do better. That's the person who, who should be receiving the supper. If somebody says, I'm, I'm aware of my sin, I don't care, that person should not receive the supper. That person would be judged uh, by, by Christ at the supper. So, um, so the... Uh, so yeah, this this should at least be brought to the pastor if it's uh, not necessarily public sin, but something that's being done in private. Anyways, um, so the goal isn't to to have big overarching quarrels. The goal is not to not to just hurt the person involved. The idea is to try and instruct them gently. So try to bring them to the faith. Try to show them the peace and love of Christ. And sometimes you have to be harsh in in uh, wording. Or, or action, say, like with a excommunication, that's a pretty harsh action. But it's supposed to be a gentle instruction so that this person remains in faith. So if somebody is aware of their sin and they're coming to church anyways, well, church is where they're going to hear their sin condemned. It's going to, going to be where they hear their false teaching being corrected from the pulpit. So as long as they're keeping quiet to themselves, like there's no reason for them not to come to church because this is where the Holy Spirit is offering the correct teaching of these things by way of, uh, of his uh, 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 or called and ordained ministers. But yeah, they, they should not be participating in, the, in um, sacred things because that's not where they belong, because they're, they're openly denying what is properly of God. 
So, um, do we need to? Uh, so yeah, the ultimate goal is for them to repent, to come to repentance, receive forgiveness. But yeah, if they're if they're unrepentant, it is well. You're they're always at arm's length, or they're excommunicated. Like, those are the options basically. Uh, because yeah, I won't I won't kick out kick somebody out of the out of the church who's not disrupting the church. But if they are sinning quite deliberately, and they know that they're sinning, they know that they're they fall fall into God's judgment, and they're not stopping. They don't want to stop. They they're choosing sin over God, and I can't. I as a pastor who has been entrusted with uh, the sacred things like the, the word and the sacrament, like I can't give them the sacrament because they're unrepentant sinners. Anyways. But yeah, I will still try to gently instruct them, bring them over to the, over to the correct understanding of faith and to the to, to proper relationship with Christ. Anyways, uh, and lastly, verse 26. And they will come to their senses, so... In repentance, they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. And really, this is it. Where the people who were lost in their sins, they're following not God's will, but Satan's will. Because Satan wants to take us away from Christ. Satan wants us to live in the wickedness of the world. Satan wants more souls to follow him. So, if you are denying the Trinity, if you're denying the person of Christ, if you're denying salvation by grace, and you're not living in that grace, you're not living according to the faith, uh, you're choosing sin, then, yeah, you are of Satan, not God. So that's what Satan wants. That's that's how he built his kingdom. So we do hope that people will come to their senses, that they will escape this trap, because it is a trap that people will be enticed by whatever sins or whatever ideas they have. And and even if it is ideas, false teachings, like sometimes it, not all the time, but sometimes it is just about their own egos, their own pride, saying like, ah, oh, I have the true teaching, which is kind of the central core of um, um, Gnosticism, that heresy, because it's all about private knowledge. Like, ah, oh, I, have, I have a greater knowledge than everybody else, therefore, or everybody else has to do what I say and, and follow me in my teachings. And it, is, it is very much an ego trip. Like, yeah, the, Satan preys on, on sin, so if you just keep on doing this and, and you're being confronted with the truth and you're denying the truth, you're just doing what Satan wants. Satan is the father of lies. He's the murderer from the beginning, and he murders how? By way of sin. Uh, getting people to fall into temptation repeatedly. And, yeah, this is what happens. So, hopefully, people who are in sin, who are, who are denying Christ tonight and God, the trying Lord, that they will repent, that they will come out of Satan's grasp, uh, and we will we will be praying that this actually occurs. So, so actually, let's uh, let's close in prayer. Lord God Almighty, we thank and praise you for giving to us Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that He may save us from our sins, uh, risen from the dead, uh, that we too might rise to new life. We ask you, O Lord, to guide us by, by the word of Christ, by the Holy Spirit, that we may witness the, the gospel faithfully to all people, that we may live rightly according to the word, and that when we encounter those who are uh, outside of Christ, those who are living according to their own designs, uh, living under the domain of Satan, that we preach the good news, that they too might be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. We ask you, O oh Lord, that uh, the, the truth of your gospel be proclaimed everywhere so that all may believe and be saved. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.